week, would you share how you might have had a glimpse of heaven this week? How did you glimpse the glory and goodness that awaits us all when we are in heaven, when everybody, the basic premise of heaven is everybody just recognizes that God is God and he's Lord, and we just want that. We want to participate in that versus rebelling against that as we do now. And I, I'll share it with you, mine here. Mine was when we were sitting together, uh, the meal at the adult getaway, and um, I was looking around and seeing tables full of men and women and knowing their stories and how God brought them together from all different backgrounds, walks, ways, methods, but we're together because we have something really important in common, which is we want God to be God and we want to serve him faithfully. And it was a joy to hear the laughter and the smiles and the rejoicing, the celebration that was taking place around the table. That was my glimpse of, of what heaven will be like um, this week. So as you stand and greet one another, would you share a glimpse of heaven that you've had in the last week? Um, and then we'll, we'll get back into the sermon. Stand and greet one another. You are a servant of God, called, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and calling. And we are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, to all at Hopewell, who are loved by God, and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we'll be continuing to work our way through Romans and to see just how far the human being falls when we reject God's purposes and plans. It's a familiar phrase, maybe you've heard it already, that sin will take you farther than you thought you'd go. It would keep you longer than you thought you'd stay, and it'd cost you more than you thought it, you'd pay. And I think, I think of some of my friends in my high school and college years that knew the truth, right? They had the information about what was right and wrong. They even had Christian experiences in community. 
but they lacked a reliance upon God and a commitment to overcome and surrender their favorite sins. They thought that their sins were fun and manageable, not costing them too much. And for a while, it certainly looked that way. But one of the benefits, um, one of the things you gain over, uh, living longer is some perspective. Right now, I can look at these friends from high school and college 10 and 20 years down the road, and their drinking wreck their bodies, their careers, their marriages, and families. Their sexual addictions have isolated them and prevented, their, prevented true intimacy in relationship. Their refusal to accept the hard teachings about Scripture, the ones that cut against their desire, grew into an abandonment of the Christian faith, or at least any true Christian faith. Now, will, will God forgive their repentance? Absolutely. Can you be saved in the midst of spiritual coldness and distance and compromise if it's for a season? Absolutely. But sin can and does put you on a path towards destruction for yourself and others. Again, sin will take you further than you thought you'd go. It cost you more than you thought you'd pay and keep you longer than you thought you'd stay. And, and so we're going to look at a couple more key sins that God is going to highlight in the book of Romans, signifying how we're all in desperate need of salvation today. So let me pray, and we'll get into the text. Father, I ask that our head and our heart and our hands be conformed to the image of the Son through the Spirit's revelation of the Scriptures. May you renew our minds and our eyes so that we might see evil and morality as you do. And may every word out of my mouth honor you today. Amen. Um, we're on you know, Romans 1, 24 through 32. We're on sermon number 6 on Romans. You can fill it in into your sermon guide or your sermon notebook for the year. Um, and we're going to start with the sin of envy, right? So it says here, right? They are full of, again, we're picking up in the middle of the verse or the chapter, the, the section. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and maliciousness. Right? Again, we're talking about a couple sins here in terms of buckets that categorize. And this list will start with envy. That's what we use to kind of signify all of these, right? The one we'll focus on. Now, last week, we spent time talking about coveting. And these are really, you know, to be handled side by side. They're, they're really two halves of the same coin, closely related ideas. I chose to parse it, like last week, talked about coveting in terms of the way that we interact with God. And I want to talk about envy in the way that we interact with people. And now this, again, this is not a precise thing. If you see in the Ten Commandments, we're called not to covet, right? That word used for your neighbor's house, wife, servants, or livestock. But again, it's the same heart, that inter that of coveting or of envy or of jealousy that shapes how we can act with God and towards others. So envy. Envy is this, when I am not content with what I have because I see what you have or what they have. And it results in the fact that I want more than you or I want less for you. It often is tied in with a fear that other people have it better than you. So covet and greed at its core is just a lack of contentment, a lack of contentment. And envy is when we turn that lack of contentment outward. I'm not content, I'm turning it now on you. Again, I want what you have, or I want more than you, or I want less for you. And this is a really a big deal for a lot of people. It's the root of all types of harm, right? I mean, envy, Scripture says, is a powerful enemy. Look at this one, right? Proverbs 27, 4. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stop? Stand before jealousy, right? Synonym for covetousness or greed. Who can stand before that? Boy, oh boy. Jealousy is a wicked and dangerous thing. Let's get back to our list here. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. Now, again, let me just quickly, what are these other words he's talking about here and how they might intersect a little bit with envy? Uh, murder, that's unjustified killing. We see in Jesus' teachings that, that you commit murder in your heart, when you are unjustly angry at a brother, so how often has your envy over someone got you angry with them? Thus, in Jesus' words, right, and his teachings put you at a spot of, I'm in my heart murdering a brother. Um, strife, that's quarrel, contention, dispute. You know, the person who, who we, everybody thinks they should probably be a lawyer, even though most lawyers I know don't actually argue like that on a regular basis. Uh, I, I'm envious, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to argue with you to justify myself and have to have my way. And it's because I'm envious of my intelligence and of my rightness and your wrongness. Um, the person that's deceitful, that's the idea of baiting a hook. I'm a fisherman. I love doing that to fish, right? Baiting a hook. Just cunning to deceive them, catching or trapping. I'm envious, so I'm going to try and deceive you into thinking more of me than I am. Or I'm going to try and deceive you, having you take the bait that I'm selling so that I can get what you have or get ahead. 
maliciousness. That's the idea of bad disposition or bad character. And I'm sure we all know somebody who is just downright grumpy, short-tempered, and quick to criticize and complain. And if you listen carefully to what's going on in their heart, as reflected by their words, they just seem angry with their lot in life. Oftentimes people become this soured, malicious, grumpy, bad disposition because their career went the way they didn't expect or someone hurt them or their finances didn't work out or a relationship broke down or someone betrayed them and it soured them, right? It soured them. And so they, they then it often expresses, well, I'm grumpy at your good fortune. You didn't have to face what I had to face. Your life didn't go sideways like mine did. So now I'm grumpy with you. Envy, church, is a common source then for murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness and it's never spoken of in a positive light in the scripture and it drives us to these behaviors and and i want to what i want you to see is what's often behind our actions right we have this um inability sometimes to see behind the action to what's really motivating it Right? Uh, and, and to really get to the heart of what's going on inside of you so that God can really bring healing and clarity and, and change, right? Is, is have to understand what's really going on inside my heart and maybe your heart to help you. And it takes the ability to ask good questions to get to the heart of the matter and to slow down and think in a, in a courageousness to be honest with yourself and with others if you really want to get to the heart of the matter. I mean, I remember talking with plenty of people, right? And I'd ask them, why did, why did you do this? Why did you say this? Why did you respond this way? And, and so often I get, well, I don't know, or I felt like it, or they did this. It takes the ability to ask good questions, to slow down and think, and to be honest, to get what's really behind the action. And too often, what they, what's really going on isn't that they don't know, or they felt like it, or someone did this. The, too often the motive behind this sour action is, is I'm just envious. I'm just not content. Envy sours relationships, right? Maybe you, you know this, it sours, it sours relationships. I, I, I can't be happy for you with what you have. Instead, I'm making things about me, right? So you, now you see how envy becomes selfishness here. Um, I had a, a good friend in my undergraduate education that I let envy strain our relationship. It was on me. And what was I envious about? Now, in this stage, it seems kind of silly, but what I was envious about was that we were in Greek class together, so, you know, two years straight of Greek. He would start studying for a Greek vocab exam when he stepped out of the dorm room. He's next door to me, and we'd walk to class. He'd just look at his book, and by the time we'd get into class, he would ace the vocab test, never miss a thing. I'm thinking, well, I studied for hours, and I beat the class. Greek was the only class I struggled with. The only one I had to work really hard in and didn't get you know, A's at in college. Like, it drove me absolutely bonkers. I was envious of his ability to quickly memorize Greek vocabulary words, and it strained our relationship. Like, what a silly thing, but it did. Too often the things that we are envious about are quite simply silly. I was envious. It started to strain our relationship. The other thing about envy, not only does it strain a relationship, it also does something to you. And too often what I see when it comes to envy is when I'm envious, it results in me becoming passive. I become passive. I see what they have, and I don't think I can get what they have, at least the way they've gotten it. So, And I, I can't, can't get to their level, so I'll just give up, right? right? So when I saw my buddy who could memorize Greek vocab that quick, and I'd spend hours and still be the dumb test, it kind of hurt my motivation to study. Like, oh, wait, really? I work that much harder than them and get less results? Why am I even trying? You know, why don't I just settle for less then and just give up because it's not fair. I'm jealous of what they have, right? And you've probably seen that in your own heart or others, right? How much motivation for life, how much of our calling are people not walking in because you've been robbed of motivation because envy has made you passive, right? Oh, I can't be rich and a millionaire, so why even try to save? I can't have a six-pack, so why do I even go to the gym, right? Like, you know, like there's no other benefits to the whole process here. I, Look, the third thing about envy I want to say is that it's also a driver for the American culture, right? It strains relationships, it makes you passive, and it's a driver for much of our culture, envious. And if you can't see that, clean off your glasses, right? I mean, this is just so obvious when you start thinking and asking the question, is what, what are they selling here? Much of our social interaction is designed to stoke your envy in each other so you would desire more. More stuff, more experiences, more leisure time. Much of our entertainment and commercials is driven by envy. Uh, so much of our posturing is, is putting on the appearance of good wealth and success so that you can be the source of other people's 
envy. You might not think that on the surface, but that's really what's going on under the surface. I want to look good. I want to look better than you. Because I'm not going to envy you. If anything, you're going to envy me. So much of our social interaction is driven by envy. Well, okay, that's the problem. How do, how do we diagnose envy, right? How do we discern it in ourselves and how do we help overcome it? Look, let me just say, let me just give you a couple diagnostic questions. When you're interacting with somebody, and again, if you want to help a friend, a non-believer to see it, if they're interacting with somebody and someone gets a blessing and you're not happy for their blessing, you're likely envious. If I can't rejoice with the blessing you've received, then I'm probably envious. If you see a blessing someone else has, and it creates disappointment and dissatisfaction with your life, you're likely envious. If you have a constant feeling of sadness, it might not be from biological depression, right? And again, I've been there before. It, mi it might be from envy. When envy is a major feature of your personality, of, of your heart, it becomes a constant dreary calculation of how everybody else's lives are better than yours, and you become saddened from that. If someone's envious, let me give you two ways to respond to it. You can help others with this. You might need to help yourself with this. First, first response to envy is move to contentness. Contentedness. Choose to be content. And that's a very, that's an indicative statement. I'm telling you to do it. It's, it's not a lot of psychology here. It's not a lot of fancy stuff. Just choose to be content, right? How do you do that, right? Well, you make a choice. You make a choice to be grateful for what you have, to what you've been blessed with. So you, you make a choice to turn your gaze away from what others have and do. You look in the mirror and say, what has God blessed me with? What has God given me? And here's the thing, right? Um, with envy, I, I guarantee you there are people that know you, and I, get, and I promise you, there are millions of people around the world, no matter your situation in this room, there are millions of people that would cha change places with you in a millisecond. Guarantee you. You can think, man, my life is miserable. My life is awful. Yeah, you go home to a house. That's quite a few square feet per person. You go home to a house that has running water, electricity, and food on your table. You have a closet full of clothes. You are not worried if you're going to eat tomorrow. You have access to incredible health care. Even if you don't have a lick of money, you still have access to incredible health care. You, you mean you have, many of you people have a community of people by your side that will walk alongside of you, support you, and encourage you. You have blessings in this room, every person, that most people in the world would, would trade their lot with in a millisecond. I'm talking to Steve and Lisa, right? Lisa with chronic health illnesses. Like, you know her story. You know all the stuff that she's been going through on the prayer list. You know, I was we were chatting about the sermon this morning. I'm like, me, man, Lisa, I'm chewing on this point, right? I want to tell the, my church family that each person here can be content because there's millions of people that change lots life with you today. And thinking, man, out of everybody I think about it, Lisa's is the hardest lot for me to change with the amount of health stuff you have going on. She's like, Ryan, I get it. I'm grateful that I don't have cancer that I had two years ago. She was talking about a friend of hers that she knows much younger that has kids that, you know, has breast cancer, right? And she's like, she's grateful for her position in life and understands her blessings, even though she's at a spot where most of us would, would run away from. Every person here has so much to be grateful for. You want to stop being envious, start being grateful for what you have. Don't begrudge another lot in, don't begrudge another lot, another's lot in life. First Timothy says it this way. Six through eight. But godliness, look at this, with contentment, godliness, right, righteousness, holiness, living a life for him, with contentment is what? Great gain. Great gain. For we are brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Look at this. If we have food and clothing, we will be content. I look at my life, most of the things that are that I'm not content about. They have nothing to do with food and clothing. They have everything to do with all the luxuries and extras. And look, look at this. Like, godliness with contentment is great gain. Just, I, just want you to, I want you to observe the force of this, right? Don't skip this great gain part. What happens in us when we are envious of each other is you think it will be a great gain if I get what they have, right? If I can achieve their status, their wealth, their leisure, their whatever it is, if I can get that, I'll have great gain. That's the heart of envy. There's a great gain to be had if I have them. And then, you know, Scripture says, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
The great gain that you want is not found when somebody else has it. It's found when you are content with what God has given you. That is the great gain. You will have a better gain being content with what God has given you than you will have trying to strive for what somebody else has been given. Do you understand that difference? Do you understand why this great gain is so important? The old adage, you think the grass is greener on the other side. And if we always think the grass is greener on the other side, you're going to miss the fact that there's great gain to be had by being satisfied with where God has placed you. Contentment. First solution to envy. Second one, though, is different, right? There's a, there, I'm not, okay, contentment can have its two-edged sword, right? Be content. But we say, but, but shouldn't I want to strive for more in certain things? Yes, yes, you can. We talked about that last week, some, didn't we? There, look, if you are looking at something and there's a trait, there's a blessing, that and it's, a, it's a good, it's a good thing, and it might be, and it's maybe even a good thing for me, when I look at you and the good thing that you have that might be a good thing for me, I can choose to emulate you. Like the second solution to envy is emulation. Envi emulation is this, right? Two people, and I think I'm inferior to you in some way. You've got some advantage over me. You, you are farther ahead than me in some aspect or category in life. And instead of being sad that I'm not where you're at, I replace that sadness with a desire for that, and I'm going to learn from you to get there. I'm going to, instead, instead of seeing you as an enemy or an obstacle or a challenge or someone to be envious of, I'm going to come to you and say, how do you do that? Can I learn from you? Can I emulate your action, your choices, your way of life, emulate your thinking, so in your footsteps, so that I might get to the same path? Envy becomes selfish. Emulation is constructive and geared towards change. Envy wishes harm for the other, rejoices in bad fortune. Emulation is a positive force. Now, look, I do this all the time as a pastor, with other pastors, right? I can step into a room and be with people that I look up and say, man, those guys got it going on. There, there's some part of their life, their character, their ministry, they're just home running it. And I can choose to be jealous or insecure about it, or I can choose to say, what's going on? How'd you get there? What can I learn from you? Um, I did this in college a lot, right? Um, kind of a silly story, but it might be helpful for you. Um, you know, I, I was a pretty athletic dude. You know, football, wrestled, soccer, baseball kind of stuff, right? Um, but in college, I, I started running with a cross-country runner. Well, that was an experience, those little wiry dudes. And, uh, you know, so I ran with him, and he could outrun me all day long. And then I, li so I did that in the afternoon, and then I lifted with a buddy who was a bodybuilder. Right? So I got a little wiry dude in the, in the afternoon. I got this big hulking monster in the morning, right? We'd go live in the morning. And I wasn't as big, you know, I didn't have the biceps of my buddy Phil, and I didn't have the speed of my buddy Rick, right? But instead of being envious, I tried to emulate them and learn, and I partnered along with their workouts. I just said, what are you doing workout, Phil? I'll just join you. And you know what? I was never as strong as Phil or as fast as Rick, but I, but I learned a lot, and I was well-rounded, right? And I was certainly stronger than Rick and faster than Phil, if you keep all those names straight. So there you go. But again, I could choose to be envious of what they had, or I could choose to emulate and just come alongside and learn from these guys. And it, you know, it put me at a posture, and it helped remind me that I should interact with people, not in a way that's envious, but in a way that learns. What are you doing? How are you doing? Now, this idea of emulation, it's not just like a psychological one. It's a Christian one. Um, you see it in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 11. 1. Let me read to you. Paul's words to the church is this. He says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but the advantage of many, that they may be saved. So he, he gives, he tells people what he's doing, and then he has this line, right? Be imitators of me then, as I am of Christ. So what we see in Scripture is this idea of when someone's good at something, when Paul is an expert at building a church, witnessing for gospel, laying his life down, right? Not thinking of himself, but the good of others. He says, do what I'm doing. Imitate me, because I'm imitating Christ. And Christ puts people in our lives to paint a picture and to give us an example of what godliness looks like. We don't just go to the scriptures for it. He gives us the benefit of the church. We get living examples of how people have applied the scriptures into their lives as they follow Christ. We can see it in different ways. So, young men, if you're looking at older guys who have careers that provide for themselves, their families, and allows them to be generous, some notes I hit on you about last week, go ask them how they did it and emulate their way of life. Be humble enough to say, how did you get there? And learn. And then have the courage to do it.
If you are a young woman and you see an older lady who acts with dignity and respect and good character and a peaceful spirit who manages a home well, you know, it's a Proverbs 31 kind of woman. Don't be envious of her. Go emulate her. Take her out to a coffee or a tea or whatever the heck ladies do and say, can I learn from you? So let me just summarize by this. Envy is against God's character. It's against God's design for us, and it's not something God gives, it's something God gives us over to. It is a taste of hell in this life so that we might turn away from and accept God's perfect will for us and his ways. Next big one here is gossip and slander. <laughs> gossip and slander, right? And he says it very clearly. Continue on. They are gossips and slanders. People rebelling against God are gossips and slanders. Another set of closely related words, so we'll kind of handle them side by side. Um, both signify someone who's going to go about destroying another's reputation by misrepresentation. Um, tip, you know, typically, we say the gossips are the whisper in your ear kind of people. The slanders are the posted on Facebook, you know, put in the public kind of thing. So that's the two kind of basic ways we parse out those two words. And, uh, and for many churches, this one's the more dangerous, the gossip is, because I don't know what you're saying. Like I walk into a room and all of a sudden my relationships have changed. Like people uh, interact with me different or look at me different. Why? Because maybe someone's been saying something about me without my knowledge, right? So this is a really dangerous thing for uh, a group of friends or a church family. It's often about covering insecurities when you gossip. It's maybe often motivated by I need to get attention. Or maybe I'll get status and approval if I, if I tell you what I know. Like, look how much of an insider I am. Proverbs 31, or Proverbs 16 says it this way. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisper separates close friends. Let me just talk about a couple ways that um, gossip will impact a community of people. Um, first, it destroys trust. Right? And I mean, it's pretty simple. I bet probably everybody here probably has a time when someone has said something about them that was private or not true, and it damaged their relationship, right? It, it means that I couldn't trust you. Um, it isolates. When someone's gossiped about, it tends to isolate them. It turns people against them. It also isolates, though, the one gossiping. Don't miss this. If you gossip, you tend to be more isolated uh, because the one, like, the one who gossips to you will also gossip about you. So um, I can't, you're not trustworthy because I don't know if you're going to keep this together. So you become isolated. It also creates fakes, like gossip inside of a church community or a group of friends will create a bunch of fake people. And this is a defense mechanism, right? Like if, if, I, if I share who I am with you and you're going to spread it and twist it to wound and hurt, then I'm not going to share who I am with you. So I want to put on my Sunday best and my Sunday smile and actually have my life together so you have less ammunition to throw at me, right? So it creates a church of fakes. And ultimately, this will stunt your ability to grow in Christ, right? People get stunted in their Christian journey because of gossip, because of all the factors we just listed, right? I don't let people in to see the real me. I'm isolated from relationships. I don't have trustworthy people in my life. And so my spiritual growth is stunted. This really affects people. Let me give you, though, a couple kind of guiding principles as we talk about gossip. I think these are important. Um, first, I just want to argue for the sake of the inner circle, right? Like, I think it's valuable and allowed and good for every person to have a couple people in their inner circle, like they're Peter, James, and John, Right? that get the inside scoop of what's going on in my heart that I can speak to without very little filter because they're, these, these are people that are going to listen to what I'm saying about somebody else, and my frustrations, my hurts, and they're going to rebound it back to me in the name of Christ. Like, hey, let me help you think about this better. Let me help you process this. They are a safe listening ear and a voice of godliness in your life. That's, that's perfectly appropriate. Trusted people that aren't just going to say, oh, I'm so sorry, let me lick your wounds. Like, they need to have that happen sometimes. But also say, but hey, let's think about this in a way that honors Christ better. Have your inner circle. Um, secondly, I just want to say there is a difference between gossip and teen ministry. And sometimes it's hard to feel this way if you're the subject of teen ministry. But I'm a big fan of teen ministry. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, when, when, when groups of people work together to care for others. When I say work together and I say teen ministry, I, I'm, I'm saying more than just like the classic prayer request thing. Right? Like, hey, let me share with you a prayer request, which becomes a thin veneer and excuse for gossip. Right? Like, um, it's... It reminds me, like, hey, here's a prayer request for you. Let's you just pray for this person because, right, it reminds me of that joke about Southern people and how they can be really rude but very nice at the same time, right? Like, like a Southern person can say anything they want about you, the most horrible, rude things, and they say, bless your heart at the end, and it's fine, right? Like, Daisy, you, you we're good, right? Daisy, well, girl, you're dumber than a box of rocks. Bless your heart. Right, like, I know, it's no, you know, she's a smart lady, good lady. 
right? But you can say anything you want. Just say, bless your heart at the end, and all of a sudden it sounds nice. Wait, I can gossip however I want and say, pray for them, and all of a sudden it's magically fine. No, I'm not talking. That is not teen ministry. That's, a, that's an excuse for gossip. What I'm talking about in teen ministry is what we do a lot of times at Hopeful, right? Like, like I will chew on a situation with people, with the elders, to say, I need to figure out how to navigate this. Or if someone's interacting with the body and we're seeing sin or ungodliness or something that's just their life's getting out of control, like, you know, we, we're, people around you should be talking. About how do we help this person? How do we help this family? I mean, like, hands-on really help. Not just, hey, did you hear that's happening in their life so we can make fun of them or just, you know, quote-unquote pray for them, which we hardly ever do. I mean, actually come alongside and help and speak the truth and support. We need to have team ministry around each other so we're coordinating. And again, the goal of that is to help each other do it. So it's team ministry. It's a valuable thing, good thing. Um, if you're not part of the problem or solution, stay out of it, right? You can say, I don't really want to hear that one. I'm not really part of sol who's solving that problem. But, you know, I'll, I'll encourage you as you do it. I'll give you another guiding principle, which is um, always present. The one thing that helps me, you know, like I've had to catch myself a time or two with this is, you know, you've heard it before. You know, would I speak this way about that person if they were in the room? Or would I be embarrassed that I'm telling my, my wife about this thing if they were in the room? My wife's my, part of my inner circle, so let me go to Alyssa, right? You're not part of my, you're not part of my three, Alyssa. I love you. We're good. But you're not part of my three. Um, you know, right? If I go to Alyssa, hey, if I'm telling Alyssa about this person, is, how, would, how would that person respond knowing that I was telling Alyssa about the situation, right? It, always being present. And the last one here is, is this. Right? And I just want to say, when it comes to gossip, I want to remind you that faith empowers this. What I mean by that is this. Um, if you are going to, a fun, you know, looking at money and going to invest it, you invest money very differently. If it's money that you need to pay your mortgage next week or to put food on the table tomorrow, you handle that money differently than, hey, I've got my foreseeable bills covered. I've got a steady income stream. Here's some extra money saved. I want to generate some wealth with that, right? You apply that money differently, right? You can take different risks. Right? So Nicole and I were young enough, we have some money set aside that we were taking risks with to hopefully gain some wealth. May or may not. That's separate from the money that we need to pay the mortgage next week, right? As believers in Christ, like you have a security in Christ that is beyond any risk of damage. Like who you are as a person in Christ cannot be touched by gossip. You have a savings account that's secure that gossip can't wound and can't rob from you. So if I know who I am in Christ, if I am saved, filled with the Spirit, like secure in Him, then I can, out of faith, take a risk to let you in, knowing that at, at some point I'm going to get burned doing that. Right? Someone's going to wound me. It's happened before. I'm sure it'll happen again in my time. But you know what? That's okay. Because I didn't need that anyways. I'm secure in Christ already. So if you have faith in Christ, that allows you to take a risk with relationships. It allows you to risk potential of gossip by opening up and being vulnerable. Does that make sense? All right. Two points down. The next ones are a couple, a little bit quicker. Gossip and slander, then let me summarize. Gossip and slander are against God's character. They're against God's design for us. And they're something that God gives us over to. It's a taste of hell in this life so that we might turn away from it and accept God's perfect will and way. Uh, let's talk about pride. Oh, oh. Overcoming gossip. Did I miss the whole point? Let me do this. Okay, sorry. Let me get this point. Sorry, let me backtrack. Freestyling too much. How to overcome gossip. Um, first, ask for help, right? And just confess that. But secondly, I thought this was really insightful. Look at 1 Timothy 5 sometime and give that a good read. Uh, summary, what's going on. Uh, Paul's giving instruction to Timothy. So God's giving instruction to Timothy on how to navigate the church's welfare program for widows, right? If you're a widow, you don't have a sense of in source of income. In their time, you, you're dependent not independent. He says, don't sign any widow up who's younger than 60 for the daily allotment of bread. Right? Tell, tell those widows to go get remarried. Why? Because their char that group is characterized by idleness and gossip. Now, it's not about women, so just take the gender part out of this for a minute and just say this. When people don't have enough important things to do, we do dumb stuff. And when you don't have enough important things in your life, you tend to go to gossip. So if you have a problem with gossip, let me just say this. Go fill your life up with something valuable. Like get involved in your church. Get involved in non-for-profits in your community. Get involved in a life that actually matters. And go do something that will demand of you. And all of a sudden you realize, I don't really have time for gossip. And I don't really have an appetite for gossip because i got more important things to do. 
than worry about this little things I tend to gossip about, right? And that's the principle that I'm seeing that's happening here. Like, hey, idleness is not good for us. Go fill your life with important things. Helps overcome gossip. All right, pride. Verse 30. Um, here, They're ins- haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Oh, this is a good list. And disobedient to parents, right? If you can read this list without a cringe every once in a while, you, you, something's wrong with you, man. I just, woo, oh, man. Okay, look, we're going to look at each word and how they kind of um, connect with God, uh, or connect with pride. Um, he says, haters of God. Boy, that's a hard one, isn't it? I can't think of a more foolish thing to become than enemy of God, right? What kind of delusion of greatness do you have to have to set yourself up against God? That's what he's talking about. Um, insolent. Um, this is a person that just, for whatever reason, because of your wealth or your power or your social status or your strength or your intellect or other ability, you think you're better than somebody else, right? Like, I'm just better than you. I treat you with contempt because you don't got what I got. Um, haughtiness is air, you know, haughtiness, arrogant and proud, boastful, braggart, arrogant, inventors of evil, right? I can indulge in my uh, sinful desires with creativity. I can take the creativity God has given me for good things and apply it to evil. Um, disobedient to parents, that's, a, oh, I love that one. Um, Hudson, especially, yeah. My son's sitting in the front row up there, it's kind of fun. Disobedient to parents, this is just pride in young people, right? And this is a big deal. Like, pride in young people is a big deal because it sets them up for a life of unrestrained pride. Right? If you don't learn to check pride as a young person, you tend to be dominated by pride as an adult. And, and uh, in short, that's just really on us as parents, right? I know some kids are more humble by nature. One of my friends said, yeah, all my dad had to do was look at us funny and we were crying right um they, they just were soft like they're clay others are like steel like i can hammer and hammer and get real creative with my disciplines and real painful my disciplines and it just doesn't seem to move the needle very much um parents if you it's on your shoulders to work with a child who's prideful and disobedient and and again that's on us to work to look at it, if you neglect your role to address this with your children that's your god assigned responsibility and you're gonna have to give account for that one and so um, God's put a human life in our hands as an adult, and it's our job to cultivate a dependence upon God and a humility that says, you know, I'm going to learn not to be prideful with God, and I'm going to learn that by learning to obey a parent when I'm a kid. So don't get lazy, parents. Don't get distracted, discouraged, short-tempered, or take shortcuts. Like we've got to stick at it. But disobedience of parents shows up here because it's pride in a child, and it'll lead to a prideful adult unless there's an intervention, right? So we've been talking around pride. Let's focus on it directly. Augustine famously said, St. Augustine said, pride is the root of all sin. Maybe not technically true. Might take umbrage on the formal theology, but it's a really good idea. Pride ultimately is elevating of the self, right? I'm going to overestimate myself. I'm going to think more of myself than I am. And it's it's one of the key psychological components to narcissism. Right? So if you're prideful, right? Yeah, let's say you're my counseling guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah pride is, is a component of narcissism. You know, people that, and life's all about them. They can't compassion, they're not compassionate to others. It's just, it's narcissism. You can look at that up if you want. That's pride. And it's defensive in nature. It's not a true estimate of who you are. It's just, I'm overestimating myself. Let me just talk about this in our context for a minute. I think as believers um, in, the, in the American church, um, there's a real space to confront pride. Maybe it's just my experience in college and in seminary that, that you know, we're real leadership focused, right? I mean, all, every class, all the time, leaders, 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 we're cultivating leaders, you know, and I was pretty good at it. Like, I won two student leadership of the year awards my four years at college, right? Like, 50% of the time I was there, I was bringing home the bacon, you know what I'm saying? I was doing pretty good. But, um, but I see, that I've seen, right, in all this is this, this element of pride that undergirds that. And I've seen people hold up as great leaders eventually fall because of pride. Perhaps part of the reason for neglecting of the sin of pride in our Western context is be- because um, we see less wrong with pride than we do with a person who is humble or feels inferior. We find pride less offensive than self-effacement. We, we conflate pride with a leader. We can conflate pride with confidence. And so we, tend, we can tend to excuse or even value or even praise people that become that are prideful because we think that's leadership. We, we've forgotten this verse, James 4, 6, therefore God opposes the proud but give grace to the humble. I was part of a conversation with a, a church leadership team one time, and they admitted that their, one of their pastors was prideful. Like the, the elders of the church said, yeah, this pastor is prideful. 
And they said, what are you going to do about it? And they're not doing nothing about them. They're going to keep them in this place because they're effective. And I'm like, quote this verse to them. Like, what do you do about that one? You know you're putting a pastor in place who God opposes, right? And it just, <laughs> why? Because pride looks like good leadership a lot of times. It looks like confidence. Can I just say this, church, we should be filled with confidence. We should be. You should be a really confident person. Not self-confidence, but God confidence. What, what I mean by that is this. I can look in the mirror and say, I am not great. I am not that capable. I'm not that powerful, creative, or wise. I have plenty of times had to learn this lesson, including the last couple months, as God brings me to the end of myself and say, you know what? This, this pastor gig is real tough when I try and do it my own strength. But you know what happens when I get up in the morning, get on my knees and say, God, it's not my will, but your will done today. God, I'm dependent. You, you know, I just need you today. I'm laying down my life. Help me because I can't do this sucker on my own. You know what happens when that happens? A lot of happening in that phrase. God changes, right? I, I grow in confidence because the good things in me, then they're not. They're not me. It's Christ in me. Christ in me is great. Christ in me is creative. Christ in me is powerful. Christ in me is wise. And so I can be wise and creative and powerful, but it's not me. It's Christ in me. When I learn to be dependent upon him, all of a sudden I'm filled with confidence. Not because of who I am, but because of who Christ is. Knowing that who he's called, he's also equipped. And that he goes before me. And he makes a way for me. As he does for you. So I guess I, my encouragement would be, let's open our eyes to the flagrant praising of pride in our culture. I, I think pride is the praised vice in our time. It's going to praise it. Let me just transition this again. Pride, and notice what I'm doing, the repeated phrase, right? Pride is against God's character. It's against God's design for us, and it's something God gives us over to. It is a taste of hell on this earth so that we might turn away from it and accept God's perfect will and way. And for our last point today, we're going to talk about this phrase, give approval. We see it here. It says this, though they know God's, this whole list, right? Gossip or slander is pride, disobedient to parents, right? Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, all that we've been covering the past two weeks, deserves to die. Check this. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. God is teaching us that people who know wrong, who know the difference between right and wrong, and know there's a consequence for doing wrong, people not only do it, but they give approval to those who do it. Um, let me just uh, maybe identify something that's probably happening in you. As I've worked this last two weeks to the Romans sin list, uh, something's probably taking place, which is this, right? We talk about pride, you go to the extreme example, right? You're going to the extreme. Right, we have this bandwidth of acceptability of normal, of normal behavior, of good folk behavior. And we talk about these things like pride and arrogance and greed and sexual immorality. You're going to the extreme cases, the things that deviate outside the norm. Right? Um, you, you, when I think of pride, you're not thinking about the everyday cases of pride. You're thinking about not the subtle pride of someone who just thinks they're a little bit better than you and kind of comes across that way. But you're thinking about the, the person that wrecks their life and has a dramatic fall because of pride. Right? Um, you're not thinking about the anger that we might have with a neighbor or coworker or family member like that, that we tend to just justify and think it's okay because it's in this window of normalcy. We're thinking about the anger that leads to someone like getting beat or arrested or being violent, right? Like we think about the extreme cases. And because we go to these extreme cases in our mind about when we talk about these sins, what we're likely not doing is putting ourselves in these categories. Right, it's part of my mission as I walk through these to say, wait, maybe, maybe you and I are in these categories. May, or maybe, more specifically for us today, maybe the non-believers that are in my life are actually in these categories. I introduced this question last week that are, are the non-Christians around me really like this? Like, like this scripture seems to be extreme. Right, it's, we tend to think in the extremes. This is scripture just about the Stalins and the Hitlers and the terrorists of our day. And it's an important question for us to ask. Is, is, is my neighbor really like this? Because the whole point of this section of Romans is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Are the people around me in desperate need of salvation? Are they desperately wicked? Because, you know, quite frankly, you and I are probably surrounded with generally nice, well-behaved people who would consider themselves good people. Or, in shorthand for today, good folk right? We're surrounded by good folk. We're northwestern Indiana, baby. We're good folk people. We're known for our friendliness and hospitality and our tender ones. What does this 
You know, are they really filled with evil and pride and slander and gossip? And, and one of the ways maybe to understand what's really going on on my neighbors is to say, well, what do they give approval to? What do they give approval to? Because this shows us a heart. What do the people around us celebrate and champion and fight for and applaud for? What do they acknowledge? Or, um, and we just acknowledge this when it comes to pride in our leaders. But you can see what people celebrate and give approval to by what makes it onto our news or what makes the most money in our culture and what gets the greatest recognition or what themes dominate our movies and our TV shows or what stances politicians take because they're simply just reflecting to what they think the majority of the population or their segment wants. And, and I see what kind of sins or destructive things are getting the approval of my neighbor or my community. And then I realize, oh, well, the good folk around me ain't so good. When you sit and consider it, yes, even the good folk around us are given over these things. We're desperately evil and wicked. Look, and humans are getting really good. Our technology allows us to put a good veneer on. It right? allows us to hide who we are. I was talking to my wife. Um, we saw something on like um, uh, what, Selling Sunset or something like some trashy show we watched a bit of or whatever, like uh, uh, people selling uh, real estate in, out in California, and these ladies went and got drunk. And then they got IV drips afterwards to help them overcome their drunkenness. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. She's like, actually, my coworkers and friends she knows do the thing, right? Like, so we're at a stage now where, like, you can go out and party in on Saturday night and get totally trashed and drunk, right? And then you schedule ahead of time, you know, Sunday morning, someone comes in with an IV bag full of vitamins and nutrients and liquids and whatever can come up concoctions. They poke you, they inject you with this stuff, and you feel really good again. You're good to go. Like, the bags are gone. You're not dealing with the hangover like you know what i'm just saying it's a sin little it's a it's a incredible new thing for me that's like oh that's just here in fort wayne okay right there's services to fort wayne providing this um th it's just a small little example of how good we are at hiding our sin right like we we look like good folk but we're just really good at hiding things anymore we can put it under the rug we can isolate more we can get an iv drip to help us recover from our drunkenness just no don't take any ideas from that anybody here who's struggling with alcohol Sorry, that was supposed to be a good yeah, what wasn't funny. What I hope to do in this section of Romans is to recalibrate our consciousness. Right? It's the whole point. Like I talked about the wood cutting example last week, cutting the stairs, is to recalibrate your conscience. To to look at this window that we talked about, where we look at these sins and go to the extreme cases and we have this acceptability of normal, but just realize this acceptability of normal is really rotten. Like like that the fact that most of us have allowed our the guide on our table saw to drift, and we've cut that stair way too short and realize, oh, we have, we have fallen way short of God's standard for us. And again, go back to Jesus' teachings. What, what he brings to the table for a bunch of self-righteous Jews is this law that penetrates deeply. And, and he goes beyond condemning the extreme cases to saying what's in your heart, what's in the inner person, you're whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're dead. The stark reality is when we look at Jesus' standard and we look at our neighbors, and we look at our in the mirror, we see that every human being that's ever existed, barring one, is a wretched person in desperate need of forgiveness and grace. Every human being, minus one, is in desperate need of forgiveness and grace. So let me just say this. We see admirable traits in people who don't belong to Christ. Absolutely. I have friends who don't follow Christ, and there are things about them that I can respect, right? Because um, every human heart has, every human has the image of God in them, and the line between good and evil runs right down the center of the human heart. So I know non-believers who are kind and, generate and can, generous and compassionate, and I can respect them about them. Believers, non-believers are real friends of mine, but the reality is both them and me are, are in desperate need of forgiveness and grace. And so oftentimes... The, the veneer of generosity and kindness is really hiding a heart of, of insecurity, pride, self-centeredness, workspace righteousness, trying to be better so they can be accepted. And God's standard is perfection, church. We've talked about this with God's wrath. Perfect holiness, uncompromised obedience, and wavering faith. And it's not a cruel standard, it's a good one. I just want to remind you of that time and time again. God's standard of perfection is not cruel, it's good. He hates sin. He's provided a way out. Here's why this is a good thing. 
If God's standard wasn't perfect, then heaven won't be perfect. And I have no interest in continuing in this life of brokenness and misery forever. Like, like just end me now. Like, I just would be done. I, I only want eternity if eternity is perfect. And eternity is only perfect if God has perfect standards and will make us perfect in Christ. And that's the gospel. And that's what we celebrate. And that's what we come back to. And that's what shelters us. And that's why we need to start here in the book of Romans that each one of us is a wretched sinner in desperate need of forgiveness and grace. Each one of your neighbors is that as well because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, again, um, I know some good, I was talking to the worship team this morning about it. I'll make it a lot shorter. I know some good, well-meaning, wise pastors who I respect who maybe wouldn't get into this kind of content with you, wouldn't spend a whole sermon nailing on four sins and, you know, just deep diving them because they're, they're not fun. Like, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, we're not walking out of here like, woohoo, God is awesome. I'm so encouraged today. And I might have, might have struck home to some of you. I think, you know, there's a reason why they avoid because it's a tough message. But, but we're committed here at this church to always preach God's word, even if it's a tough message. But, but what needs to happen for this to do its job is if this is a tough message for you, if this is, there's something in one of these sermons that hits you close to home and God brings to the surface and say, I'm kind of prideful. I'm a gossip. I slander. I'm malicious. My heart's in rebellion against God. Then you, you cannot do this on your own. Like, the commitment is, you don't wrestle this on your own. You come talk to somebody. You come talk to me. You get one of our directories. There's all of our elders on the front. There's the guys that come up and pray every week. Like, like talk to somebody. Talk to one of your small group leaders. One of the, you know, talk to somebody. If you walk away from this with conviction and you don't talk to somebody trusted and wise about it, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. I just want you to hear that clearly. My part is to preach God's word without fear and with, with, with just reckless abandonment and confidence and boldness. Your job is to hear it, receive it, and then to respond to it. And I'm telling you the way to respond if you're feeling conviction is pushing into God, pushing into relationships. Don't miss that. That's your end of the bargain. All right, let me pray for us as we wrap up today. Um, God, look, man, we, whew, we're swinging hard here in Romans. It'll get better, we know. But God, I, I thank you. I thank you that we're here. This is a good word. It's a good word. I need this. Like, I need this today. I need the ability to look in the mirror and, and see where your standards have called me out on envy. Not just my old self, Ryan, but even like, like regenerated in Christ, newness, uh, uh, pastor, saved Christian Ryan has these moments of pride and envy. I see it creeping in. God, thank you for your clarifying word. Thank you for helping me um, through the lens of Jesus to know that you don't just care about the extreme cases of these sins. You care about the minutest part of my heart that wants to give in to pride and arrogance and envy and gossip and bitterness and slander and that you bring that to the surface. You illuminate truth in me through my family, through my church, through the word, through the spirit so that I might confess and confront and, and repent and be healed and delivered from it. So God, that's ultimately we say thank you for an awareness of our sin because it drives us to the cross where there's life and salvation and peace and joy and everything good. So God, may we be driven to the cross today. And more importantly, maybe not more importantly, but also, Lord, may, may you help us to encourage our friends who don't know you, who are enslaved to sin, to be driven to the cross. Help To help them to know their need for your grace. Thank you for your word today, even when it's hard. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, worship team, uh, you want to come up and lead us in some peppy awesome songs to close out? stand with us as we continue in worship um, at this time also uh, the ushers can go ahead and start passing the baskets for offering
Ryan sort of touched on it already, but uh, my professor of worship at Huntington, his name is Jay, uh, him and I are still very close and very good friends, but one of the important lessons I learned from him is if you feel that pride creeping in, if you feel the selfishness or the arrogance creeping in, all you have to do is spend a little bit of time at the foot of the cross of Jesus and just remembering his death and his sacrifice for you to uh, get you to turn around really quick. And so I would like to just make space for that uh, this morning, just spending time before the cross, thanking the Lord that we don't have to stay in that arrogance. We don't have to stay as we are. We can be constantly moving and changing because of his grace and love for us.
Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I hope dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Put up the benediction verses. Um, let's let's go past that, the Romans memory verses for right now. I want to get to those that Romans 15. And on a, on a day like today, I just want you to understand the result of the gospel. Right, this is the first step. Here's the result. Right, the result of recognition of sin, of bringing that before God and others, of confronting these things. We've talked about in a very serious way today. Is that the God of hope? will fill you with all joy and peace in believing in him and the resurrection of Jesus and what he's done to bring you new life so that by the power of the spirit you may abound in hope this is the result so let God's word result in this to you as you overcome the sin that maybe God has brought to the surface today so go through the process and end with hope and peace and joy amen amen love you grateful for you um, tell your friends that weren't here today that they're shenanigans, you know, they're, you know, slackers or whatever, I don't know, razz them a little bit, and then join them next week in being a slacker, or next year in being a slacker as we do another adult getaway, but thanks for being here today, we love you, bless you, see you next week.